This is Unit 2, Module 5, Bioenergetics. So under Course Modules, Unit 2, um, Exercise Physiology is the uh, module title, and then it's uh, Bioenergetics Lecture. So this is looking at how the body takes substrate, carbohydrate, fat, protein, uh, and we usually refer to that as food as wheat, and turn that into the energy currency that the body recognizes and it's not calories. Calories is a measure of heat. The body is looking for a particular chemical, uh, chemical formula so it can do um, muscular contraction. So we're going to talk about this terminology of bioenergetics, uh, metabolism and exercise training, talk about this molecule called ATP which is the, the, um, the role, and then talk about how we manipulate exercise to, to manage that. So bioenergetics is this whole um, the conversion of macronutrients, what we know is fat, protein, and carbohydrate, into biologically usable forms of energy, which is ATP. We'll talk more about that. Um, catabolic or catabolism is looking at the breakdown of larger molecules into smaller molecules. This is both looking at food that's ingested and then also tissues of the body. Uh, anabolism or anabolic processes are the just the opposite, the synthesis of larger molecules, and metabolism is the net sum between those two. Aerobic are metabolic pathways that are in the presence of oxygen, anaerobic are without. Um, just a note here that the aerobic system is always working. You are never switching between aerobic and anaerobic. You're either aerobic exclusively or aerobic with the addition of the anaerobic system. And then endiocene triphosphate, the ATP, that is the cellular fuel source that the body's looking for, not calories. All substrate, sugar and fat, is converted to ATP for the body to use. This is that adenosine triphosphate. Uh, there's your uh, amino acid with a ribose nucleate and then one, two, three phosphate molecules. Uh, this guy here shows a little better. Um, this is where um, the important aspect is, is that nothing is consumed in the process. For cellular function, you have adenosine triphosphate, tri for three, one, two, three phosphate molecules, and a metabolic or chemical process happens, and this third phosphate molecule is cleaved. And what you end up with is adenosine di two diphosphate, so you go from ATP to ADP, and that phosphate. The energy that was holding this phosphate molecule onto there, that energy is released, and it's that energy that drives cellular function, and in this case that we're talking about muscle contraction. Um, so bioenergetics, that's the terminology, that's the term I keep on using. Uh, this is the process of turning substrate, fat, and carbohydrate into ATP. Oxygen is either present, aerobic, or not present, anaerobic, and determines both what macronutrient is being utilized and how much ATP is produced. And then this O2 environment is driven by exercise intensity. So this whole chain of command of looking at which fuel source are you using, fat or carbohydrate, is there oxygen present, and if there is or isn't, what exercise intensity are you at? These are your three primary fuel systems. You have the phosphagen system with creatine phosphate as the substrate, so that's your fuel source. You have the glycolytic system with glucose as the primary fuel source. And then you have the oxidative system with fatty acids as the primary fuel source. Now, each of these is not exclusive. You can get glucose oxidatively, and you can do partial metabolism of fatty acids in the glycolytic, but these are your primary components. The phosphagen system is this recycling system that is your short-term high-intensity activities. It's a transition system from low intensity to high intensity or for short bouts of a high burst of activity and then back down to rest. Um, phosphagen system, um, the one takeaway with the body is that the body does not store ATP. ATP is always produced on demand. So you are currently producing ATP in one of your energy systems, oxidative or glycolytic. And if you're at rest, you're able to synthesize all the fuel sources you need with the air coming in, the oxygen coming in, and the, the ATP that's floating around in the system there. It's being produced from those two systems. When you increase exercise intensity, for instance, like getting up to run or walk up a flight of stairs or something that's your body starts to produce... Um, your body takes the ATP and it needs more ATP. What the phosphagen system does is take the spent ADP. So I'm just going to back up here. Your body's producing ATP from either sugar or fat. ADP is the byproduct of that cellular process for your breathing, heart rate, all your basic metabolic rate. ADP then is processed later on and reconverted ATP or discharged or whatever it's, whatever happens to it. There's multiple pathways, but 
what we're what this phosphagen system does is it takes one of its phosphate molecules from the creatine phosphate and basically recycles ADP into ATP for for it to fuel that physical activity and to either just f f f uh, fully do it or allow another energy system to catch on. So that's what the phosphagen system does. It's using creatine phosphate, um, um, creatine phosphate to take one of its phosphate molecules and recycle ADP back into ATP. Uh, control of the phosphagen system is really driven by this law of mass action. It's basically saying the concentration of reactions or products in solution will drive the direction of reaction. So basically, if you have enough creatine phosphate in the muscle tissue, um, you're going to be able to sustain that recycling system. And you really can continue to go in the phosphagen system until you run out of creatine phosphate and ADP can no longer uh, be converted to ATP. The next energy system is the glycolytic system, glycolysis. This is the breakdown of carbohydrates. The glycolysis is the breakdown of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are stored in two forms of the body, either glycogen or glucose. Glycogen is stored only in the muscle or liver. Glucose is the transport form while it's in the blood, either on the way or from the tissue. Um, glycogen or car carbohydrate is only stored in the liver or muscle, um, small amount like maybe 100 to 200 grams in the liver and then 12 to 1400, it all varies on who you're reading, the individual obviously but the size of the muscle. But the takeaway is not the exact numbers but to understand that you have a limited supply of glycogen within the body. Anything excess of that supply storage is converted to body fat. So one of the tenets of looking at uh, metabolism and exercise fitness and your fitness goals of aesthetics, weight loss, fat loss is consuming just enough glycogen to maintain your glycogen stores and minimizing any spillover into body fat. Um, excess protein is converted to sugar and then converted to fat and then excess sugar is converted to fat and then excess fat is converted to, is converted to fat. You're never converting really fat to sugar. But you have a limited supply in the liver, small amount, and then a limited supply in the, a little bit larger supply in the muscles. And the only way that the glycogen can leave the muscles is through high intensity activity your muscles cannot supply glycogen for other parts of the body. Your liver, however, can. So that small amount, 100 grams or so, is really meant to supply the nervous system, the brain, because the brain doesn't have its own supply of sugar. And the sugar that's stored in the muscles is there for high intensity activities. Outside of that, the body preferentially prefers to burn uh, fatty acids for fuel because of the metabolic bang for its buck. Um, Sugar can either be metabolized in an oxidative pathway or it can be metabolized in the glycolytic pathway. So basically, sugar can either be go through fast glycolysis, which is in the presence of, uh, without the presence of oxygen, that's an anaerobic process, or it can go through slow glycolysis, which is, a, um, which is uh, in the presence of oxygen, you get a full complete burning. In fast glycolysis, you get a byproduct called pyruvate. Pyruvate is um, then turns into lactate and in anaerobic pathway all of that lactate can be processed um, easily cleared by the muscles there's no accumulation in the muscle or accumulation in the blood with higher intensity activity you are burning through more sugar more rapidly you're getting incomplete burning your uh, lactate production from pyruvate is greater than the clearance capacity of the muscle tissue so you're still a, the system is still working it's just that now instead of clearing all of it there's some remainder left over that remainder accumulates both in the muscle and in the blood and is measurable both in, in, the, in blood work. But it's sensed not in the blood but in the muscle and that burning sensation you get is that accumulation of lactate within the muscle tissue. It debatable on whether it contributes to fatigue or not. There's not a, a distinct uh, link between lactate accumulation and fatigue. It's usually thought but it's not the case. Um, but that burning sensation is there and it's only there typically during anaerobic activities when the energy production of glucose uh, is metabolized partially and the accumulation of lactate is happening faster than which the muscles can clear it out of the tissue. This image just shows that, that um, fast glycolysis, lactate production that's carried by the blood to the liver, the liver converts it back into sugar, sends it back to the muscle for fuel or wherever else it's going to go. Um, if lactate production is faster than the conversion, you're going to get an accumulation here and an accumulation here. When the, that accumulation occurs, 
this is called the lactate threshold. And this is a measurable aspect using exercise physiology to measure exercise intensity, where you're, if you're in low intensity, you're moderate aerobic versus anaerobic. And this is the measure of the anaerobic threshold. So if lactate is present in higher amounts in the blood, you've crossed that threshold and you're in an anaerobic activity. Training has an effect on this. This is uh, untrained individuals at rest, and you can see that the lactate threshold is crossed much easier than with untrained individuals. So basically, an untrained individual can do a lot less than a trained individual, and they'll go from an aerobic state to an anaerobic state much quickly. So a four mile per hour run for a trained individual, that's a warm up aerobic state activity. For an untrained individual, that's equivalent of running to exhaustion. Oops. So it is some numbers that we use in exercise phys. Um, and th these are just measures of exercise intensity. So in the end, um, we go into more detail with this in KIN 231 when we look at um, ex uh, exercise phys and VO2 max. But <clears throat> just understand that blood lactate is a accumulation, is it a byproduct of high intensity anaerobic type activity. The last energy system is the oxidative system. This is the primary source of ATP at rest during low intensity activity. It uses primarily fats and then as we talked about the slow glycolysis carbohydrates. Um, you'll read a lot of textbooks where people will tell you that carbohydrates are the preferred fuel source, um, not fatty acids, but that's only because the body vehemently defends blood sugar levels. And the only way the body can lower blood sugar levels is, is take the blood out of the, uh, take the sugar out of the blood and either store it in the muscle as muscle glycogen, convert it as fat, or burn it off as energy. And so when blood sugar levels are elevated, think of your fat stores as your savings, your checking account, and your uh, sugar, your blood sugar system as your um, cash in your pocket. You will not go to the bank and draw out money from your ATM if you have sufficient cash in your pocket. So if sugar levels are elevated, the body's not gonna preferentially burn fat for fuel. It's gonna burn sugar for fuel first, bring sugar levels down to where they need to be, and then go back to burning fat for fuel. So sugar is only used because of that um, toxicity. The body perceives it as a threat within the body. Alcohol is burned preferentially to sugars. So by that logic, alcohol should be our primary fuel source, and that's not the case. Um, it's just a toxin the body is trying to get rid of because it's in a toxic state, right? It's not a toxin by itself, but just because of the, the levels of it. So the body preferentially burns fat for fuel because it is a metabolic powerhouse. It is the most bang for your buck in terms of conversion. Um, this is your form of fat. You have This is what a triglyceride is. You have a glycerol molecule with three fatty acids. Um, fatty acids are long carbon chains that can be used for fuel. All fats preceded as sugar. So almost every fat that exists on this planet was a sugar at some point. And fat is a storage form of sugar. You have a limited supply of sugar in the body. You have an unlimited supply of fat in the body. Now, it's interesting in humans that sugar easily converts to fat, but fat does not easily convert back to sugar. So fatty acids do not convert. Once a sugar is stored as a fat, it needs to be burned as a fat. Glycerol does have some capacity to convert back into sugar, but uh, just keep that in mind that you want to you want to minimize your sugar intake, carbohydrate intake, so that you're not getting that full conversion over to fatty acids. Not that it's a bad thing, it's just that once it's converted, you have to burn it as fat. So you notice here that the other macronutrient that we haven't talked about is protein oxidation. Um, protein is not a significant source of energy for most activities. The body does not like to do it. If there's a sufficient fat or sufficient sugar, the body will not use fat for fuel. Um, excess protein is converted as sugar first and then fat, but typically we look at protein as a, as a sugar and enters into that glycolytic pathway. This last part here, you'll see the yield of these um, glucose and glycogen during oxidation and not. So glucose, if it's metabolized in the oxidative system or slow glycolysis, it's gonna produce you 36 units of ATP for one unit of sugar. In the glycolytic system, when it's fast glycolysis, it's only gonna produce you two. So you're getting a 18 fold times increase uh, of the energy production. When you look down at triglyceride with the average size fatty acid chain, it's going to vary based on how many carbon chains there are. You're getting about 463 units of ATP for every unit of fat. So we learn calories that there's four calories per gram uh, for carbohydrate, nine calories. So it's twice energy density. But when and that's just a measure of heat, when you're actually looking at the fuel source, 
it's uh, 100, more than a hundredfold increase in terms of energy source. Um, so the, it's, when we talk about metabolism and fat loss and weight loss, everything we just talked about in terms of what energy system is really important. For understanding energy system relative to fitness and testing, um, understanding the relationship between production and rate is um, it's good testable material. It's it's good to understand, but in the end, um, you have you're looking at these systems, these four energy systems, based on their yield, how much they actually produce. And when you look at the previous slide, you'll see that the that fats oxidized are going to be your highest yielding system, and sugars fatty oxidized are going to be at the at the lower end. Even lower than that is creatine phosphate, the phosphagen system. For one unit of creatine phosphate consumed, you're only getting one unit of ATP. So that's the that's the lowest yielding. But what you trade off in yield, you pass over in speed. So phosphagen is the fastest, right? There's no conversion of substrate. It's just a recycling of ATP. I give up its phosphate molecule and bang, you're right back in business. Whereas fatty acids, they take longer. They're your slow burning fuel source. So think of them as like your logs on a fire or charcoal. And your glucose is your kindling, like paper or twigs or fuzz or whatever. Dryer lint is a very good uh, fire kindling. And then your glu your phosphagen system is like your lighter fluid or your gasoline. So they're going to bang really quick explosion, but very little heat. Um, but inverse is true for the log and the wood. So um, that's, these, that's what these next two charts look at here. They kind of rank. Um, what energy system are you primarily in to, to a type of exercise? So the very first slide that we talked about in terms of which energy system you're in is really driven by the presence of oxygen, and that's driven by the intensity of activity that you're doing. High intensity activity, things you can only do zero to six seconds, that's your phosphagen system. Six to 30 seconds, that's going to be a combination of phosphagen and fast glycolysis. 90, or 180 seconds going to be truly fast glycolysis, and you see the transition here to anything you can sustain for longer than four or five minutes is going to be the oxidative system. So if you're going to take away anything from this lecture, memorizing this slide and understanding this and understanding what type of activity. So for instance, shot put, that event maybe takes six to nine seconds tops. Um, you're primarily going to be in the phosphagen system. Um, the hurdle event, 110 yards, probably going to be, you know, right around fast glycolysis. Uh, mile run is going to be the oxidative system. And so just tying up exercises or activities with these particular energy systems. And then this is what I was talking about with the rate versus yield. So you'll see the four systems here, phosphagen, fast glycolysis, slow glycolysis. Ignore the, um, well, this is oxidation of carbohydrates. Um, so you can see this, these systems here. And then the rate, in terms of how fast they produce, they're ranked this way. And then the capacity, they're ranked uh, from, the rate is ranked from fastest to slowest, and then from lowest yielding to highest yielding. So your fats, your fat oxidation is going to be the highest yielding, and your phosphorus system is going to be the fastest producing. This is an important thing to understand, is at no time during exercise or rest does any single energy system provide the complete supply of energy. There's always a combination of two or three, two or three systems going at any given time. This graph here shows the three energy systems. This is your intensity here at the bottom. This isn't time like starting at zero and then 10 seconds, 30 seconds. This is intensity. Keep in mind, you are start when we read this graph, we have a tendency to want to read left to right. But you're not starting at, at high intensity. You're starting at low intensity, really low intensity. So you're way out here. You're at this long-term mitochondrial respiration or the oxidative system. And you're at rest, because even at, even at sleep, you're still burning energy. Right? You get up, you start to move around, you get, brush your teeth, take a shower, walk outside, run, do your exercise. All that transition, you were going from right here and then just varying how much more intensity you were adding on to your system. This is also what we were talking about earlier when we said that you're always in the aerobic system. There's never a point in your life when you're not breathing, unless you're dead. So when you're dead, we're not really worried about energy, intensity, your heartbeat, everything else. You are breathing, so you're always in the aerobic system, and then occasionally, when you do high intensity activity, do you have to add the anaerobic system onto the aerobic system? But even when the high intensity activity, you're still breathing, you're still got aerobic activity going on. So it's either aerobic or aerobic and anaerobic. You're always in the oxidative system because you're always breathing. It's just that what changes is how much of that percentage of that energy is fueling that activity. So 
at a high full out sprint, you're still breathing, you're still oxidizing fats, but fats aren't cutting the mark in terms of producing energy fast enough, your body has to shift to faster burning fuel sources. So when you go for a jog, you go from the oxidative to the oxidative and the glycolytic. Then when you go to a sprint, you're in all three systems. So it's the highest intensity activities that elicit all three. With that said, even at low intensity, way out at when you're sleeping, you're still burning sugar for fuel. Albeit it's only 2 to 5% of your total energy production with the remainder coming from fat, but you're still in that energy system. So none of those energy, it's like a pilot light on your, on your furnace. You're not using your furnace in the middle of the summer, but that pilot light is still there so that when the heat kicks on, it can kick on right away. This kind of shows where those substrates come from. So this is the catabolic effect of taking large food components like a sandwich and then breaking down those individual um, breads or meats and cheeses and so forth. And then those macronutrients become substrate and then they become their smallest components. And then all those small, smallest components eventually become ATP. You do see here that protein is used for other aspects, right? Fat has some pro aspects. Um, meat protein has quite a bit of functional, functionality of the amino acids. As I said, the body doesn't like to really burn it. It wants it, Protein is coveted in nature. It wants to use it for storage tissue. But if there's an excess, the body will convert it to sugar and then and enters these pathways. The one thing that I'd notice is that carbohydrate has no other function in the body. Its only role is fuel. Okay, fat has some, some responsibilities for vitamin mineral transport and tissue integration, some structure. Protein, full structure integration. Carbohydrate, there's no necessity for that. It's only a fuel source. Um, we'll talk more about that in the nutrition aspect. So, um, yeah, this uh, these next few slides talk about the substrate depletion and repletion, basically talking about you use it, now you got to restore it, right? And um, the that law of mass action talks about that the availability of the substrate is what drives these reactions. So if there is enough phosphagen there, you're going to be able to drive it. Um, this is just kind of talking about the, rep the repletion period and in about three to five minutes that creatine phosphate uh, can occur and then eight minutes. So that's why the, your, your phosphagen system is really taxed during workouts. You'll do a set, rest, do a set, rest, and continue your workout that way. And we've talked about we, if we haven't talked about it, we will talk about it in class, um, about creatine monohydrate supplement, supplementation and why it's been so big and popular. And this is part of the element of why there's a, could can be seen a benefit in the creatine supplementation. Um, and then the same thing for glycogen. And, and we don't really look at fat store uh, repletion because fat's just a spillover. It's really glycogen versus phosphagen. And we don't really take about phosphagen so much, but... Um, what's interesting to note, and when we talk about more about metabolism, is that glycogen depletion only occurs during high intensity activity, right? It does occur way out here at this lower intensity, but for the most part, um, most, most of your sugar depletion is happening during high intensity activity. And recall that your sugar storage in the muscles can only be used by those working muscles. So if you want to prevent sugar from converting to fat, you want to make sure that you have a reservoir for that sugar when you eat it. So if you're going to eat a carbohydrate-based meal, um, it better match your activity level. So if you're a runner and you're doing daily runs and you're spending a lot of time in the glycolytic system burning through your sugars, um, you are going to create a reservoir. You're going to be able to basically eat pasta and bread all day, and it's all going to be stored as glycogen and really get very little conversion of fat. On the other aspect of that, if you're a sedentary individual, or let's say you're training out, you're working out, but you're only working out three days a week, you have other four days that are rest days, you are low activity days, right? How much sugar are you burning sitting at your desk, walking around in your car, or doing whatever? You're probably not burning a lot. So your your availability of repletion, you're already saturated. That sugar's there in the muscle. So when you eat that carbohydrate, your liver will be topped off. Any muscle glycogen that was burned, this little bit, will be burnt, and then everything else is converted to fat. So it's interesting to start to think about the body in terms of its activity levels and what substrates being used in terms of driving your dietary requirements for that day. For someone to eat the exact same thing every single day, same calories, same macros, everything, that's in that's missing the mark in terms of a nutritional fitness program. Uh, with that also told, if you have competition or different events, not eating enough of the right substrate for the event that you're going to do can also limit your performance based on that law of mass action. If you're carb depleted, 
and you're trying to do high intensity activities and your glycogen levels are way too low and your body's not used to using ketones for fuel, you're, you're not going to have the performance. You're not going to have the energy to get through your workout. So that's the um, recap of the bioenergetics. Um, the next part of this lecture gets into the aerobic and anaerobic systems, and I'm just going to create that as a, as a second video.